Good afternoon from Notre Dame. I'm Kevin Brennan with the Notre Dame Alumni Association. Thanks so much for joining us for another edition of Catching Up With. Our guest today is an author, a motivational speaker, and a member of Notre Dame's class of 1996, Alex Montoya. Alex, thanks so much for taking the time to join us on Catching Up With. Thanks for having me. Um, Alex, uh, out of curiosity, before we uh, kind of get started and, and, and learn more about your story, where are you coming to us from today? So today I'm coming to you from San Diego, California, uh, which is my hometown. Um, the downtown branch of the San Diego Public Library uh, actually has a computer lab called the ICANN Center, and it's specifically for people with disabilities. They have um, uh, special services and enlarged uh, workstations and, and enlarged um, uh, access features that allow people like myself uh, who are disabled uh, to run our businesses, run our enterprises, uh, everything out of this computer lab. So that's where, where I am daily running my uh, my business and that's where I'm coming from today. Great. Sounds like, uh, sounds like a great organization. Um, Alex, we want to talk about all the incredible things you've accomplished in your lives and your, your disabilities as you um, made reference to there, but we always on catching up with like to start off at the beginning. Um, so if you would tell us, you know, where were you born and, and, and where did you grow up? Sure. I was born in Medellin, Colombia, uh, which is in, uh, in Northern South America, uh, in, uh, in the city of Medellin. And, uh, when I was born, I actually was born with a birth defect, um, uh, in the 1970s. Some might recall, uh, there was a, um, a morning sickness medicine, that expectant mothers call thalidomide, and thalidomide was found to cause uh, birth defects. Uh, I was one of those uh, uh, among the, the thalidomide generation, as they called it, um, that was born uh, missing both of my arms and my right leg uh, as a result. Um, but fortunately, I had a family that um, uh, very much uh, relied on our faith uh, and on our, uh, on our support system and on the belief that uh, you know, if you have a strong education, that you can accomplish anything in this world. Um, and so, you know, you have, as we can see a little bit in the video, you have prosthetic arms, I know, and one prosthetic le leg. Um, at what age did you first get your, you know, prosthetic uh, arms and leg? Sure. Um, when I was four, uh, courtesy of the Shriners Hospitals, I moved uh, to the United States. Um, I moved in with some other relatives that I had here uh, living in California. Uh, my aunt and uncle and their family. And um, I was actually fitted for my first pair of prosthetics when I was two and then moved here and received them full time along with therapy and the, the knowledge of how to use them uh, when I was four years old. How difficult was it to learn how to use them? It was, it was quite a transition because um, on the one hand, I was fortunate that I was learning all of the skills that every other kid was learning at that exact same age. Uh, but on the other hand, I had to learn uh, how to uh, utilize, for example, uh, two prosthetic arms connected by a strap harness and how I moved my shoulder would actually trigger the right uh, strap to move the right cable in order for the hook itself to move. And I had to learn it in such a way where it would become second nature to me. Um, because one thing that was emphasized to me from day one was the fact that um, uh, if I to use these as my arms, I was going to have to be able to, to react quickly to things and really have it be second nature uh, to me. So it really took about a good two years of just physical therapy uh, to learn the process of, of how the prosthetics function, how they move. And on my leg prosthetic, um, really how to properly walk with it, um, how to be able to balance myself. I used a walker for the first couple of years of my life um, you know, just to learn how to even do uh, things. And, and I tell people to not take things for granted. For example, uh, I, it took me a couple of years of physical therapy just to learn how to walk up and down stairs um, because you had to learn how to balance yourself and how to not put too much uh, weight, for example, on, on your prosthetic leg, otherwise you might fall. And so things like that uh, took some time, uh, but fortunately I was able to get it to a point where it definitely just became part of me. Um, I imagine, you know, technology over the years has improved. Have your um, prosthetics changed over the years and has it increased, um, you know, what you can do with them? have um, the the good thing is 
these days there are pretty incredible technologies out there where people can even get uh, mechanical hands or mechanical fingers um, to be able to to function on those. What I have found is that for me, the the hooks that I wear are are still pretty basic, but they actually serve the the function that I need. Um, I'm glad though that for this era that we live in, where uh, we are involved in international conflicts and we do have the most men and women coming home now as amputees than we probably ever have since World War II or Vietnam. I'm glad that there is more sophisticated technology out there for them. Um, for me personally, uh, just the the small uh, modifications that the prosthetics have, have gotten have been good enough. Uh, where I really have seen the most advanced uh, technologies and, and the biggest advancements really have been on the leg uh, prosthetic. It used to be that I would wear one prosthetic leg for walking around every day and walking to class and, and, and doing everyday activities. And then I would have another prosthetic leg for sports and to run and to jump and to dance and do all these things. Um, and now they've got it where uh, the, the technology is both uh, resilient enough, but also lightweight enough that you can do all of those things with just one leg. And um, a lot of people have probably seen on television um, the blades that kind of look like ski blades that, uh, that, that runners wear. Um, those are more available now uh, to everyday guys like me. Uh, I, you know, I haven't chosen to necessarily wear those because I don't need to get anywhere that fast. Um, but it's good to know that that technology uh, is out there and is more readily available for people no matter their circumstance. Yeah, that's great. And um, returning back to kind of the beginnings of your uh, your personal story, after you came to California and were you know fitted and got your first set of prosthetics when you were four, did you then go back to Columbia or did you stay in the United States? At that point, when I was four years old, my family made the decision that it would be best for me to stay in the United States. Um, just from a cost perspective, it didn't make much sense to uh, fly back and forth every few months. Uh, especially if the prosthetics needed a repair, or at that age uh, when you're when you're growing so rapidly, uh, they knew that I would need a whole new set of prosthetics within two years, and so it made more sense to just stay in the U.S. full time uh, and also be able to go to school here, be able to get that education that they knew. My development, um, they knew that the U.S. education system was just a little more advanced and a little more accepting than the, the way it was in Colombia at that time. Um, so I've really valued as time has gone on uh, the incredible sacrifice that both my parents and also my aunt and uncle, uh, my aunt being my mom's sister, the sacrifice they made uh, to allow me to live here uh, and get both the medical help and the uh, educational help uh, all at once and, and, and full time. Yeah, it's a great testament to your family. Um, you mentioned going to school. Uh, w when you first were young and going to school in uh, in San Diego, was it difficult, uh, you know, when you're at a young age and you have obvious physical differences from the other kids? Was that hard? The Probably the two most difficult aspects was the fact that, number one, um, I moved to the U.S. in 1978. And at that time, if you had a disability, you weren't allowed to be involved in a in a regular school or a regular curriculum. Um, they would just put you in a special education school. And so we really had to fight. We really had to advocate uh, to be able to be given the same opportunities that the other kids had. Um, but I remember I remember my aunt and uncle specifically telling me that um, one of the things that I was going to find the most challenging is the fact that if people uh, in general uh, looked at you and saw something different, uh, they weren't going to be so eager to reach out to you. Uh, some would point, some would stare, uh, some some adults would tell their kids to kind of just stay away. Uh, and of course, the kids would wonder, you know, why is that person someone I can't talk to? Um, so there was a certain amount of, uh, of education involved. And um, I remember really being as young as four years old and having my uncle tell me that I had a responsibility to walk up to pretty much every stranger, you know, the, 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 that seemed safe, obviously, and, you know, stick my hook out with their hand and to show them that I was at ease with what I had and they should be at ease as well and that they were also welcome uh, to ask me questions. Um, most pe people 
will um, will uh, refrain from asking questions just out of wanting to be polite. And my uncle basically emphasized, uh, as did my aunt, that um, I needed to be the aggressor in that situation and really be extra friendly and extra positive to just show people uh, that I was just like them. Uh, and it was certainly hard, you know, whenever you walk around and people would stare, people would point, and they would certainly, uh, you know, make you notice that you were very visibly different from them. Um, but it also gave me a responsibility early on um, to really try to try to show not only friendliness, but, but God's spirit um, through that. You mentioned earlier uh, in the conversation the importance that your family always placed on education. And then you said, talked a little bit about the difficulties at the time in the country um, in terms of students with physical disabilities and the, having the opportunities. Did that change over time in a way that you were able to, you know, have the opportunity to attend Notre Dame? How did that, um, throughout your childhood heading into high school, how did that um, transition happen? change over time and there were really two significant um, watershed uh, periods that uh, that influenced uh, number one uh, in 1980 um, I became the part of the first class of students that were allowed um, to um, uh, to go to a regular curriculum school and uh, initially there were teachers that opposed the move because they didn't know if they were prepared they didn't know if they could handle the liability they didn't know if they could handle uh, everything that came with it. Uh, so they transitioned us one week at a time to try to get both campuses uh, just used to a whole new uh, situation. And by the end of the first semester that we did that uh, in San Diego, uh, there ended up being a waiting list of teachers who recognized, wow, these kids uh, really have something to teach you know, our kids that don't have disabilities and vice versa. The kids that don't have disabilities can really help teach and educate and 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 really create a culture of inclusion uh, for the kids that have disabilities. And so it was a very successful uh, pilot program that spread from San Diego to beyond. Um, moving forward a little bit uh, within the years, uh, when I was in high school in the early 1990s, uh, in 1992, the Americans with Disabilities Act passed. And that also uh, was, was a landmark piece of legislation because it really made education uh, something that was fully accessible and fully available, both in terms of saying things like, you know, buildings need to have uh, elevators to uh, campuses need to have special services specifically for people with disabilities. It really both, both literally and metaphorically uh, opened doors that, that were not open uh, to, to people in our situation before. And so when you were in high school at that time uh, and it came time to choose your college, uh, what made you choose to attend Notre Dame? Sure, University of Notre Dame was my number one choice really since junior high school. Um, when I started looking at the fact that I definitely wanted to go to college and I wanted to find the place that was the best fit for me, um, I, I was very drawn to the fact that it was a school of faith, uh, very proud of its faith and and was not uh, trying to, to hide that whatsoever. Um, you know, I really wanted to celebrate it. Um, I wanted a place that also not only was academically strong and had uh, uh, strong alumni connections, but really was a place that fit my ideals in terms of, of passion. Uh, I wanted a place that had a place that really uh, embodied um, the fact that uh, the, the life should be celebrated and adversity can be overcome and that uh, even through great struggles, there's great rewards. And so for me, uh, Notre Dame embodied that. And um, just like just like they always tell you to do, I certainly applied to many schools and looked at many schools, uh, but Notre Dame was always uh, at the top of the list. And so when they accepted me, uh, I did a little dance of joy. Uh, because I knew that was a place for me, and I knew that uh, that I had never visited the campus at all. But I knew that even in my first time uh, that I would be there, that it was basically like coming home. Um, and what was your student experience like at Notre Dame? Student experience at Notre Dame was phenomenal and uh, truly incredible in the fact that it's still ongoing. You know, they say college is a 40-year is a decision. I like to say that it's more like an 80-year decision 
because if you choose the right place, it really should be uh, not just a physical place you go to, but it should become a part of you intrinsically. Um, and Notre Dame really became a part of my soul. Um, the thing that I, I, I enjoyed the most was the fact that um, in addition to the faith being celebrated, um, I really felt the family atmosphere from from the very first uh, minute that uh, Bob Mundy, one of graduate admissions, volunteered to pick me up from campus from the airport and drive me to campus, and just everyone's uh, willingness to help out and to to take care of of any needs that I had and take care of any challenges that I had, I felt that family spirit uh, right away. And to be frank, it was still a, a time in Notre Dame's history that was challenging because the Americans with Disabilities Act had just passed. So not all the buildings were up to code, not all the changes were implemented yet. And I think they needed students like myself to show them what exactly those changes were. And when I saw how swiftly and really how, how enthusiastically the university responded about making changes to the point of even creating a disabled services center. Uh, it really showed me the university's heart uh, all the way to the core. One question we always uh, have to ask folks is what dorm did you live in uh, during your time? Yeah, all four years. Nice. St. Edwards Hall. And, um, and what did you study and what was your plan? What did you think you wanted to do when you graduated? Sure. I, uh, I stayed in St. Ed's all four years, stayed on campus all four years, and I was uh, a communications and theater major. Um, initially, my goal was to be involved in journalism, and because uh, Notre Dame didn't have a journalism major at the time, uh, but had plenty of campus publications and things that you could write for and, and different ways that you could express yourself, uh, the communications major proved to be handy, not only for that, but really for a variety of careers. Um, I recognized that the communications aspect of it um, would allow me to um, pursue different jobs within public relations and within communications, and that proved to be exactly true. Um, and then my minor uh, at the time uh, was uh, was uh, theater. Uh, it was it was specifically um, uh, communications, television, and theater. I think they they may have uh, changed the the wording now a little bit. Uh, but I love the fact that I had theater as a minor uh, because that really opened the door for a couple of other dreams that, that, that I had, which was number one, to become an author, and number two, to also uh, become an actor. Um, so we're going to, you've, as I mentioned earlier, you've accomplished a number of uh, pretty amazing things uh, uh, so far in your life, but, um, and, and you just kind of uh, helped me transition to two of them. So let's first take the author part. Um, sure. I believe you've, you've published three books. You've written three books up to this point. Um, what made you decide to write the first one, Swing for the Fences? Sure. Um, I've, I've written three books at this point, and I'm actually working on a fourth one right now. Um, I, I've recognized um, that, first of all, my story was definitely different than most people's. And um, even as young as 10 years old, I knew that it was something that I wanted to uh, really put out there into writing. Uh, a teacher of mine in the fourth grade uh, recommended that I do something involving writing in my career. So for all the teachers out there who give advice to youngsters, uh, believe me, it does work and kids do listen because I still remember my fourth grade teacher saying that and, and me really pursuing it as a career. Um, but my main mission with Swinging for the Fences was I wanted to really emphasize to people that, you know, I had a pretty severe set of circumstances. And if you look at the odds of somebody missing three limbs, being able to go to college and go to a school like Notre Dame and be able to to make his dreams come true, uh, the odds are probably pretty low. And I certainly had every chance in life to just say that it was too hard or that the circumstances were too extenuating. Um, but I chose to and go for more and try for more and recognize that I had really an opportunity to overcome um, that, that you know, was really a significant and then substantial opportunity. And I wanted to show people that it's the same in their lives as well, that they certainly don't need to be born as triple amputees, whatever struggle they have in their life, whatever challenge they have in their life, um, they could overcome it as well. And so I wanted to emphasize that. I wanted to utilize the, the aspect uh, at the time I was working in Major League Baseball, 
And I wanted to use the analogy of swinging for the fences, trying to hit that home run, really living in excellence. Uh, the, 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 the principles that I outlined in the book can be something that they could also utilize to overcome their adversity to also live in excellence. Well, good luck as you work on your uh, fourth book. The other uh, dream you mentioned and um, something you studied in their name was acting. And I understand you've had some pretty prominent uh, uh, film roles. Can you tell us a little bit about your acting career? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so I've been very blessed to be in uh, two Steven Spielberg films, um, Artificial Intelligence in 2001 and uh, Minority Report in 2002. Uh, they, were, they were very bit roles. But the nice thing was um, they specifically were roles where Mr. Spielberg uh, wanted people with prosthetics because he wanted to take the prosthetics, add some special effects, and really make them into robotics. And um, it, was, it was a great example of taking something that the world might view as a challenge or as a negative and utilizing it as a strength. And so for me, it not only allowed me to fulfill that dream that I had had since I was a child of being involved in acting and, and having my, my my minor be theater, um, but also to utilize that example of, you know, take what the world says is not a good thing and use it as your strength, you know, flip it around and show that it's a strength of yours. Um, I ultimately uh, decided not to, to pursue the acting route uh, and just try to, you know, accomplish some other different things. Uh, but it is still a goal of mine someday to potentially have uh, my story be turned into a movie and into a film. Uh, so I'm hoping that uh, that can be accomplished someday as well. Absolutely. We'll have to go back and rewatch those movies and, uh, and look for your scenes. Um, you also mentioned when talking about your, your first book, Swing for the Fences, that at the time you were working in Major League Baseball, I know that uh, you know you grew up loving baseball. Where did that uh, love for the sport come from, and what did you do when you worked in Major League Baseball? You know, I, I love the fact that that it was very apparent to me um, that baseball was very much a part of the American fabric. And given that I immigrated to this country when I was four, um, I, I loved uh, the fact that baseball was just. Uh, you know, an extremely important part of American culture and really helped me to assimilate uh, within American culture. I still remember um, my first game where not only was was I entranced by the green grass and and the canopy of blue skies and the smell of hot dogs, but I was I was also very intrigued by the fact that um, if a player either hit a home run out, they still had to come back in their next at bat and keep trying. And at the time, I was just learning to use my prosthetics and I was just learning uh, the value of having patience and of, of, of you know, knowing that, that if something is challenging, if something is hard, that you can't just give up what you're doing uh, and that you have to find a way to make it happen. And so I saw a real symmetry with uh, the, the challenges that I was going through and with baseball in the fact that no matter whether a guy we went four for four or zero for four. Uh, he had to come back the next day, and he had to keep swinging. And that part right there, um, you know, which also led to the title of the book of "Swinging for the Fences." That part right there really uh, appealed to me because I recognized that uh, part of the the aspect of of succeeding in life and overcoming your obstacles is just simply refusing to never give up and refusing to never uh, be held down. Uh, by your challenges. Um, I was fortunate that uh, when I graduated from Notre Dame, uh, within a couple of years, I took a job as an usher for the San Diego Padres and eventually worked my way into the front office. Um, I was in their community relations department for about nine years, uh, handling all of our outreach to the Hispanic community within San Diego and Mexico. And, and uh, it really was an example that I learned at Notre Dame to be able to take uh, something that is your passion and be able to do some good through it. Uh, that's great. And while we're on the topic of sports, one other thing I need to ask you about, I know from there's a, a picture in uh, Frank Franco's barbershop in the basement of La Fortune for uh, folks who've seen it where uh, you're carrying the Olympic torch. What's the story behind that photo? Sure. You know, probably my proudest moment uh, so far is I was selected in my senior year in Notre Dame to be an Olympic torch bearer. 
uh, it was 1996 when the Olympics were in Atlanta, Georgia, and um, uh, the the Olympic Committee or the host committee uh, sent out a, a call and uh, specifically looked for people that had overcome adversity uh, and overcome challenges uh, to be the torch bearer. And so I was extremely blown away when uh, with about a month left in my time at Notre Dame, they reached out to me and invited me to do that. Um, and, and I asked if I could represent the school uh, within that. Um, and what I what I found the most interesting is there are about 10,000 torches that uh, that are distributed, but it's just one flame. Uh, so the, the same flame that gets lit in Athens, Greece, uh, makes its way all away all the way across to whatever the host country is. And that same flame is kept in the cauldron and each torchbearer lights the next person's torch. Uh, so that year, all the way from Athens, Greece, all the way to the opening ceremonies where Muhammad Ali lit the uh, lit the opening ceremony. So for me, that was just a mind blowing honor to be connected to Muhammad Ali in, in some way. Uh, but it also reminded me that that's kind of the role that we all have is we, we are all in a sense, uh, torchbearers and all the lessons that I've learned and all the things that I've overcome uh, it's my responsibility to pass that along to the next generation and to the next group of people and show them, uh, especially kids and especially young people, that they can overcome their challenges too. Wow, what, a, what an experience. Uh, you've accomplished so much um, in, in so many different fields, but you're also, and we haven't talked about this yet, you're a, you started your own business. You're a business owner, um, A Motivational Communications. What, uh, what's the story behind that business and, and what services do you, do you offer? Sure. Well, A Motivational, um, Amo is my nickname, kind of like A Rod when he was with the Yankees, you know, Amo, Alex Montoya. So I, I took that uh, nickname and, and combined it uh, with A Motivational. Um, I deliver keynote presentations. Uh, I'm a writer, I'm a speaker. Uh, I also work with uh, students on their college applications and be able to apply to places like Notre Dame um, to, to be able to make their college dreams come true. Um, and it's something that uh, for me is both a, a business enterprise, um, but also a passion and a ministry, uh, a vocation. Um, I just believe that nothing happens uh, by coincidence or on accident. And so the adversity that I've overcome and the lessons that I've learned through it and the, the perseverance that I've been able to develop, uh, I like to say that, that I honestly consider myself the most blessed man on the face of this earth uh, to be born as a triple amputee because the lessons that I've learned and the perspective that I've seen uh, are all because of being an amputee. It's, it's, it's patience, it's determination, it's appreciation for life, and really an appreciation for your faith um, that, uh, that, that really has, has influenced me. And so I enjoy taking those things and taking those lessons and sharing them uh, with others. Well, I can uh, attest having heard you speak uh, here on campus uh, earlier this or uh, last year, actually, um, to what an what an incredible speaker you are and how um, inspiring it is. So uh, thanks for the great work you do in that arena. You've accomplished so much. You've overcome so many obstacles and accomplished so many of the goals you set out for yourself. What's next? What uh, what else uh, do you still need to check off the list? I really appreciate the kind words. Um, as I mentioned, you know, I want to continue to take a motivational communications um, bigger and higher and try to uh, continue to have that enterprise succeed. Uh, I've only been in business now for about a year and a half, so I know I have a, a long way to go there. Um, I am hopeful that someday we can turn, uh, you know, the overall story uh, into a film. So I'm certainly open to that. Um, and I'm, I'm uh, not uh, married or have any kids yet. So I am accepting resumes, uh, <laughs> you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm certainly open to that as well. So that those are probably uh, three things that I want to uh, make sure I check off. Well, Alex, thanks so much for, uh, for taking the time out to, to talk to us today and sharing uh, your incredible story. If, if people want to learn more or uh, read your books or connect with your business, where, where's the best way for them to connect with you? Sure. They can go to my website, which is simply alexmontoya.org, alexmontoya.org, or uh, I'll just give my email. It's very easy, alex at alexmontoya.org. All right, Alex. Well, well thanks so much again, and uh, go Irish. Go Irish.
And thanks to all of you who've uh, watched our program. Uh, remember, for any other episodes of Catching Up With or all of our online learning content, you can find us on YouTube by searching for the Notre Dame Alumni Association, or you can visit us on My Notre Dame by going to my.nd.edu learn. I'm Kevin Brennan. Thanks for watching.